Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Uh, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord with you all this morning. Would you stand with us as we enter into our time of worship through singing? When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So, amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Praise you, Lord. You may have a seat. So this morning, um, I get to give the announcements. Usually my lovely wife, Angie, does, um, but uh, here we are. And the original plan was that Angie was going to be camping and was going to be packing up camp this morning and would be coming back home by this afternoon. Um, much to my surprise... Uh, I got a call about noon yesterday from Angie saying that we evacuated camp because they were camping up near Estacada, and uh, and so uh, they were let known that they had to evacuate. Uh, and on that note, there's a lot of people connected with us who have had to evacuate, whether it's from the Oak Ridge fire that's going on um, I know another part of Angie's family, uh, they, they live in Oak Ridge, and so they had to evacuate. Um, and, you know, others, uh, we have, um, like, sons and daughters, cousins, friends, family, all over there. And all over Oregon, I know that uh, uh, Dave Holhauser's over on the east side, but he's safe. Uh, and so it's just, there's a lot of wildfires going on right now. And it's the strangest thing. We've gone through this entire season with, with very little impact, and then suddenly, bam, it, it happens. And so let's go before the Lord in prayer just right now uh, for those families, and then we'll continue in announcements. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you that you are such a great and loving God 
and that you see all and that you are protecting our friends and our loved ones. God, I thank you for bringing my family home safe. Um, I thank you for uh, others where they have family in the different fire zones that you are keeping safe as well. And God, even if we don't know all the reasons behind why all of this takes place or how, you know, it's determined, okay, this fire is going to be this big and, you know, you know that ahead of time in your sovereignty. God, we trust you and we look to you for help um, because this is something way out of our control. As best as we can, you know, we, uh, we put the fires dead out <laughs> that, that we do at, at campgrounds and, um, and then somehow there's some spark that just sets a forest ablaze. Um, and it's something that's been happening way more often than it has in the past. And so, God, would you help us here as we enjoy this lush, beautiful paradise of the Northwest that you've given us um, that also has its dangers? Um, and I pray that you would uh, continue to watch over our loved ones, keep them safe, be near to them, be a comfort to them, help them to know that you're near and help them to uh, to reach out uh, for prayer as well. God, we give them into your hands, and uh, yeah, we ask for your help in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, a couple more announcements for this week. So tomorrow night is uh, our small group. Uh, it's not going to be at the Booth's house this week. It's going to be at Angie's in my house. Um, and so if you would like to join us, you don't have to have covered any of the material ahead of time. Uh, all you need is uh, to come and, you know, open up your heart and your mind and, and share, you know, your thoughts on whatever topic we're t talking about tomorrow. Um, on, let's see, Wednesday, we have the midweek activities over at Crossroad. We partner with the Crossroad Assembly Church um, for their kids' midweek program, so that's kids and uh, youth group age, um, all starting at 6.30. That time still just, I never know <laughs> if it's going to happen. So it's uh, 6.30 is on Wednesday. Uh, Thursday night at 6 o'clock, we have a prayer meeting here. Um, we'd love it if you could come out for that. Um, we have a, a good time praying together. Um, on next Saturday, over at Crossroad, we, along with eight or nine other churches in the Florence area, we're getting together to pray and worship together. And I am so encouraged by this, this event um, and it's going to be from 12 o'clock noon to about 1 o'clock. Um, we'll see how long the pastors pray. Um, whenever you get a pa give a pastor a microphone, they tend to speak a long time, like right now. <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. Um, but it's going to be an awesome time of just fellowship all across town where we get to lift up the name of Jesus with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And so I'd, I'd love it if you come, could come out for that. Um, there are going to be some songs that you know. And so if, uh, you know, if the fear of unfamiliarity is something that would keep you away, fear not, my friends. Uh, it, it will be a good time. And so it's going to be great. Um, also, starting up on Saturday, <coughs> uh, kids' soccer is officially launching. I'm coaching uh, Ruben's team. Pray for me um, <laughs> as we as we go throughout this week. But we have our first game next week, and so uh, on that Saturday. So that's going to be a fun time as well. Um, and then next week is Communion Sunday, so you don't want to miss that. And that's all the announcements I have. Oh, and then the following week. Uh, just to let you know, the ladies' Bible study happens on what day? 
there it is. Uh, Monday, September 19th at 2 o'clock uh, is a ladies' Bible study. If you want more information about that, talk to Angie. So um, I think that's all I've got. So would you stand with us again, and we'll, uh, we'll continue in worship. Robin, would you pray us in? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We ask you to be with us today. Help us to open our hearts and minds to you and to lift you up, Lord, and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign Beloved Father, please come down and meet us. We are waiting for your touch. Open up the heavens, shower down your presence. We respond to your great love. We won't be satisfied with anything. Ordinary, we won't be satisfied at all. Open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessings, we want you. Open up the sky, fall down like fire. We don't want it. Jesus, we just want to see you in the glory of your light. Earth 
earthly things don't matter they just fade and shatter in we're touched by love divine we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all open up the sky fall down like rain we don't want blessings we want you open up the sky fall down like fire we don't want anything but you open up the sky fall down like rain we don't want blessings Open up the sky, fall down like fire. We don't want anything but you. Here we go, let's go to the throne, the place that we belong right into his arms here we go let's go to the throne the place that we belong right into his arms here we go let's go to the throne the place that we belong right into his arms we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary. We won't be satisfied at all. Open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessings, we want you. Open up the sky, fall down like fire we don't want anything but you you are here Way maker, miracle work, 
It's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been 
so, so good with every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your love. That you know the future, Lord. You know the past. You know each one of us inside out from the very beginning to the very end. Thank you, Father. We ask that you would continue to be over this service, Father. Help us to humble ourselves before you and receive the word that you have given. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. And kids, you are invited to go down to Kids Church with Miss Kim. Bye, honey. All right. So... Um, this morning we have a special treat. Um, it's a special treat for me at least. So I always love to hear, uh, different people sharing the word of God, opening up the scriptures and, and sharing with God's people what they found in there. And, uh, this morning we have a treat. I'm going to invite Fran, our sister Fran, you can come up to the the platform. Um, and so she's got a message that God laid on her heart. She searched the scriptures and she's, uh, she's, I, I'm excited. I don't know what all, all this looks like, but it's going to be good. And oh, sure. Here. Um, and so, uh, would you welcome her and okay. All right. Thank you, Fran. No, I get the whole cup. No, I just have to do it. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I'm on. Yes, I am. Those songs we were singing are wonderful. Why don't we just stay and continue to worship in song? <laughs> so this morning... Um, what I have for us is going to sound kind of convoluted for the first few minutes or 15 minutes or so, but I promise you it all comes together in the end, okay? And I'm going to tell you things you don't know and things you're going to say, ah, oh, did she say that? And Tim's going to be squirming. If Norma was here, she'd be squirming, but it's okay. I can back it up with scripture. <laughs> So, there's many places in the Bible, as you know, that seem contradictory, right? And we, we look at those things, and until we realize and study that section, or the whole Bible, we then come to the understanding that God never contradicts himself at all. It just seems like it until we know. So, I asked God that he would take the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth and bless you and me with them. The sermon title this morning is Give Me the Works. Isn't that what people say when they, they're, they're, somebody says, Tim, what would you like on a hamburger? And he says, ah, give me the works, right? In other words, he wants everything. 
People want juicy dripping hamburgers with extra sauce, onions, cheese, tomato, lettuce, hot peppers, avocado, and the kitchen sink thrown in. Sometimes we can't get enough of anything. We pile on more and more, more money, more things, more rules, more guilt, more laws, all kinds of stuff, including work. Now, be clear, I want you to know, biblically, work is a good thing. We know that it is because we have to do it to live. But remember, it came out of the fall. It was because of sin that we have to work. God told Adam and Eve when he cast them out of the garden, you will earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, the pain in your back, the feet that have blister. <laughs> You know, all those things. It's a result of sin, isn't it? Humanity as sinners work, though, with worldly ends in mind. Our view is not always what it should be. A very smart woman wanted her tombstone to say something special, and her tombstone reads at her death, if I had it to do over again, my house wouldn't be as clean, but I would have spent more time with the Lord and my family. Some people work 50, 60, 70 hours a week for success, for money, to get ahead. It becomes an obsession. Jesus told the, par uh, told the disciples and other people about, in the parable about the man who was building more and more and more and more barns. And Jesus said, what does it profit anyone? He said, a man, but anyone who will do this and lose their soul. And then he said, today your soul is required. <gasps> All of his work was done. That man was going to face Almighty God and he hadn't finished the work he thought he needed to do. Only as a Christian interprets the, their work in the light of eternity and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will a person understand how much they need to change. Our greatest efforts in humanity are gifts from God, but we take credit for it. Music, literature, art, language, architecture, science, all those things are meant to bring praises to Almighty God. Instead, humans walk around saying, look what I did, look what we did. It's empty and it's worthless if it isn't from the Lord. In 1 Corinthians, we read, we are all, to do all things to the glory of God. Now remember, if God calls us to a, a job to do, it is a holy act and we will do it because it pleases him and it is what he's asked us to do. But we're going to find out this morning that we can't please God, not even a little bit. The Christian view of work has a different understanding than the world does. Everything we do must be done as a divinely appointed task in which we fill our divinely appointed calling to the service of God in which we give him glory and praise. That's the work that Christians are to do. The size of the task is unimportant. The amount of time that it takes is unimportant. The people involved or not involved are unimportant. And when or where the task is performed is unimportant. We are called to be his servants. Honesty and diligence are mandatory. A servant is to be faithful, obedient, doing all things as unto Christ. But then Jesus changed and said, I no longer call you my servants, I call you my friends. That changes everything, doesn't it? Because in our minds, we think we have to keep working for him. And he says, you're my friends, you're my friends. Any activity of a Christian that proceeds from a right motive and is aimed at the glory of God, in other words, good works, 
are to be done out of love for Jesus who calls us to that task. Love is the beginning and the end of all that we are to do. Love is both the motive and the object of the task. In 1 John we read we love him, why? Because he first loved us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So did he wait for us to be good enough? No. We are not under law. Many Christians, well-meaning, and maybe some of you, but I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody, say, I try so hard to keep the Ten Commandments. You can't do it. I'm sorry to tell you. It's impossible. How many times do you wake up in the morning and say, okay, Lord, please help me not to kill anybody today. Oh, I want my neighbor. He's got the best new car. Can, can, you, can you take that want away from me? We don't think in those terms, do we? The Ten Commandments were for the people of the Old Testament. And we read in our New Testament that when God says something wonderful, he says, or Paul write, wrote it, that the law was given not to stop us from sinning, but to show us how much sin we do. Wow, God's thinking is not the same as ours, is it? We are not under the law. How many times we think that we have to continue doing things to make God pleased with us. God in our souls is both the source and the motive for what we do, and then he directs us back to himself as the reason and object of the work that he has called us to do. But James says faith without works is dead. So let's look at works in regards to salvation. I came out of a system of mandatory, endless works, so I know what I'm talking about. My husband and I together had the most amazing, remarkable, powerful shock of our lives because we found out that the Bible tells us this wonderful thing, and that is our salvation is by faith alone. Shocking. You mean, you mean everything I did was worthless? You mean God didn't want me to do those things or didn't care about me doing those things? That's right. That's right. Everything I had done, all the rituals, the prayers, fasting, giving up sinful things and non-sinful things, prayers for myself and others, praying for or to the dead, None of those things had done any good for me at all. Talk about a wasted life. But faith without works is dead faith. So I was confused. I didn't understand. Faith without works or works without faith. What is it? Our justification, and I love that word, is based on a good work. Hear me. Our justification is based on a good work, one good work, the work of Christ Jesus alone. It is his work that gives us justification, not what we do, ever not what we do. His work alone justifies us, purifies us, and glorifies God, and we can't do any of those things. The benefit of a good work is freely and abundantly given to us because it is from him and he gives it to us out of his great love. It is our belief in his ability to do exactly what he said he was going to do and then he did it. We pay, he paid the penalty for our sins by his death. He redeemed us from our sin he justifies us in his perfection for all eternity by rising from the dead under his own power, and he gives us eternal life. Wow, you can't beat that. <laughs> I gave Tim a, a picture that came out of a children's book, and it's a sweet picture. 
it, it wasn't a Christian book, but the message I thought was very godly. And that is a wooden cart full of boulders, big boulders. And there's a little boy, and he's got the yoke on him, and he's trying to pull this cart up a steep hill. And he's working so hard. He's grunting, he's groaning, and he's just working himself to get one step. And next to him is a magnificent, enormous, muscular ox. Who do you think is pulling the cart? Jesus said, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Why? Because he's doing the work, not us. We can't beat that ox. Another picture of this, which I think is wonderful, is, an, is a, a Clydesdale Budweiser commercial. And I, I think we all like to see those. They're wonderful. But this one was particularly interested, in, interesting to me, and it shows a young foal. He's got long, spindly legs, kind of skinny like the little boy. And he's harnessed to a Budweiser beer wagon. And he is oofing and grunting and working, and he cannot move that beer wagon for his life. And all of a sudden, it starts to move just a little bit. And the camera slides down the side of this big heavy beer wagon and in the back is a full grown adult Clydesdale. And if you've ever seen one up close, you know their backs are about this high. And he has his nose down and he's pushing the cart. But that little guy in the front, he thinks he's doing it. But he's not, the, the big one is. What a message for us. We who are Protestant Christians uh, are not work-oriented, we think. But sometimes we are. We, and I'm not referring to anybody in this room, certainly not our pastor who would never stand for that anyway, either, either pastor sitting here. <laughs> but there are other groups who call themselves Christians, but maybe they're not because they're so into legalism that you can't see the divide there between law and uh, what they're doing. You can be, and there's a group here in Florence uh, calling themselves Christians, you can be c accused of not being a proper Christian or not even a Christian at all if you don't read the King James Version of the Bible. If you read any other translation, you are not reading the Word of God, and so if you're not reading the Word of God, you can't know, and so your Christianity is suspect. Now here's a clue. Feder ura thu theart on hyophanum tobi coma thana raisa gahalgod. Can you understand that? It's gibberish, isn't it? But not really. It's Old English. The King James Version of the Bible, when originally printed, was printed in words like that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's what I said. And nobody, or very few people except scholars, can read Old English. So anybody who tells you that if you're not reading the King James Version, they don't know what they're talking about because they can't read it either. They're reading an English translation, aren't they? People get so silly in their legalism. And God says, I don't want any part of that. Legalism in the church is wrong. Some people will suspect you if you don't say the Apostles' Creed, you don't pray the prayer of contrition, or you don't sing the doxology every Sunday. What? My salvation in Christ is suspect because I don't do those things? True baptism, of course, is only by immersion, never by sprinkling. Really? Every man, woman, and child on this planet who was ever born or ever will be born is saved by water because we've all been in the ocean, in a creek, in a pond, in a stream, oh yeah, and in the rain. Baptism doesn't save anybody and the water doesn't wash away anything, unless you're really dirty, but <laughs> that's not what it does. The Lord's Supper only on certain days having a special order of worship that you cannot deviate from. 
Now here's one and Tim's going to squirm. Plug your ears. Tithing. It's for the Old Testament. It is not for us. It is not for the church. No, hang on. If you read about it in the Old Testament, God required the Jews, the Israelites, to give 10% of the best of their flocks, their horses, their vegetables, their uh, fruit, whatever, 10%. And then God said, you give me the best of that, 10% of that best. You give me the other, another 10%, the top 10%. And it was to, to supply and take care of the priests in the temple and in, in the tabernacle so that they had a way of eating and communicating and living. Don't we pay our pastors a salary? Think about it. Think about this, too. We can puff out our chests and be so magnanimous and say, well, I don't give 10%. Actually, I give 14%. Jesus wasted himself on us, and we think we're doing a good job by giving 10%? Oh, my. Shakespeare said it. What fools these mortals be. What about people who lovingly and consistently do manual labor for their brothers and sisters in Christ, who help them with any need that they have, especially if it's an older person? They may mow lawns, or they may rake leaves, or they may paint a house, or they may fix the plumbing, or do a thousand and one different jobs. Isn't that giving? Of course it is. God's way is so different. We say, do, 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 and God says, done. You can't be more complete than complete in Christ Jesus. There is no superlative in the English language. Tim was an English major. He can agree to that. You can't be completer or completist. You are complete in Christ. That's the end of it. God says it's done. When Jesus claimed from the cross it is finished, he wasn't necessarily only talking about the end of his suffering because his death was coming. He was talking about the fact that in him there is no more. He is our all in all. In him all humans, the all humans need is complete. In him, every law, every hope, every work, every imaginable offering to God has been paid. In him, everything is finished, completed. And you should be yelling, praise God, because you don't owe him anything. And now you're going to say, oh my gosh, what is she talking about? Of course we owe God. No, we can't pay the debt that he paid. I love that praise song, he paid a debt. I did not owe, or no, he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away, and he did. <laughs> Praise God. Yet people continue to offer good works to God, thinking that he is pleased with their offering. Rites or rituals done to gain merit, favor with God, specific forms of worship, Certain prayers or formulas of prayer repeated over and over, even words from the Bible repeated over and over are wrong. Jesus said we are not to pray with repetitious prayer. People I know, and I'm sure you do, will require, will require others to say what we call the Lord's Prayer over and over again. Whenever, if you watch any movies, if somebody's in the trenches, a soldier, and they're being bombed or something's wrong, somebody's dying, they always have the actors repeat and say the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't his prayer, it was an example of a way we could pray. It was to teach the disciples how to pray. They didn't pray to the Father, they didn't have that concept. Not in Judaism at the time. So-called righteous ways of doing things in the church. Never allowing divorce under any circumstances. Why do we think we can keep people in prisons that God doesn't intend them to be in? 
discrimination that is wrong, it is wrong. Being a pastor, a deacon, or a missionary putting you above others, sorry, you two, you're just one of the gang. Hallelujah is right. Do you know who probably God, and I'm guessing at this, I can't speak for God, but I can guess. Do you know who in a church God considers to be the most important? The one who scrubs the toilets. Think about it. That's the last job anybody wants, but whoever does that and does it with a happy, cheerful heart. Hmm, what does that tell you? So, how about laws about or rules not drinking, not smoking, not playing with playing cards, not going to the movies, not chewing gum, requiring going to church on certain days, considering those days are special or more holy than others. It can't be because we are still sinners, we cannot please God. God tells me that I'm sinful. You are sinful. Turn it around, full of sin. If I'm full of sin, how can I do something that makes God happy? You can't, I can't. We are imperfect, we are flawed. There is no meritorious good work that we can do while we're on this earth. People say, but I want to please God. I want to be good enough to make him happy. He did so much for me that I, I need to do something. Jesus said in Matthew, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What good works? It is not what we do for God, it is what he has done for us that is the good work. If we claim that we can do good things to make God happy, then we are saying that somehow we can supplement the work of Christ. That's blasphemy. That's how serious that is. Either Jesus did it all, or he left something out, and if he left something out, he is flawed. And if he's flawed, we don't stand any hope at all. We're stuck, aren't we? He is not flawed. He is perfect and holy and did a wonderful thing. Any group, person, or religion t that tells people that they can win merit before God by good works that they do or transfer good works from the living or the dead are blaspheming the Lord Christ Jesus and his accomplished work of our redemption. They are liars. Galatians says, for as many as are under the works of the law are under a curse. Uh-oh, gee. But we're not under law, we're under grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Good works are required of a believer and defined as those acts which are, are ordained by God. We read, for he, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has before ordained them. And, and that's in Ephesians, and then in Titus, Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purifying to himself a peculiar people of good works. So there's the push and pull, huh? We're under grace, not under law, not under good works, but yet we're supposed to exhibit good works. Good works are those Holy Spirit-inspired actions that lead people to Christ and glorify God. Matthew, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus. Now we need some caution. You cannot judge a person's salvation by their good works. Atheists do really good works. Wealthy atheists do really, really good works. They build hospitals, they build uh, schools, universities, libraries. They give food to the poor and they set up missions just like Christians do. The United States of America, every time there has been a, 
major disaster in another country, we send tons and tons and tons of food, clothing, medicine, tools, all kinds of things to help another country. But our nation isn't Christian in that action. It's not doing a Christian thing. It's being very nice and very supportive. You all know who Mother Teresa was? Do you remember her? She was a woman who with the nuns, excuse me, my nose just drip, <laughs> who with the nuns that were with her would go out into the gutters and pick up people who were dying, people who had oozing nasty sores, people who, who were wounded, people who had been beaten, people who were starving, people who needed water, all kinds of things that she did, and the nuns with her. Amazing things, things I don't want to do. I don't know about you, but I don't have any intention to ever going to India. <laughs> it's not a nice place as far as in the major cities. But she did that. And after her death, her writings have been made public and do you know in several of her letters and in some other writings that she says, I'm not sure about Jesus? Wow, she's not sure about him? Can you picture in your mind how she would, was dressed and how the nuns with her were dressed or are dressed today? They wear white because of the high humidity and heat in Calcutta or Mumbai or wherever they are. And it's cooler and lighter material. And they have a veil that starts at the hem of their dress on one side, comes all the way up over their heads and down the other side. And running in the middle of that veil is a pale blue stripe, continuous stripe. Do you know why they have that? It is to remind them of their submission to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Many people are going to go before the throne of grace and they're going to tell God all the good things that they did for him and, and did in his name. And he's going to say, Jesus will say, the four most ugly, nasty, horrible, frightening words ever uttered. I never knew you. How sad. How tragic. The truth of a person's sanctity is determine what they believe about Jesus, not how they act. If our sanctity was because of the way we act, we'd fall too short, wouldn't we? Because we're still sinners. We can't not sin at this point in time. We have a new nature that doesn't sin, but we have an old nature that does. We read that by faith are you saved through grace, not of works. What? so no one can boast because we tend to do that look at me i did this i give 10 percent and then god says hey i gave my all in revelation we see that we are going to throw our crowns of righteousness at the feet of jesus in thanksgiving for what he has done we are getting no reward now People say, oh, wait a minute now. Come on. Yes, we are. No, we're not. There is a reward, but not in crowns or in things. Our reward is the lamb that was slain. He is our reward. Jesus is our reward. And we will spend eternity appreciating fully and thanking him absolutely and worshiping him to the best of our ability because he is the reward that God has given. Grace is God giving me what I do not deserve. Grace is God giving me what I do not deserve. Mercy is God giving me what I desperately need. Wow! We need his mercy. We don't need to chalk up points. We can't even do it anyway. Works are to be judged out of a person's acceptance of the revealed word. What do you think about Jesus? That's the best work you can do. 
Non-believers do wonderful things for the world. They have to do their part, they say. They have to please God. No, we have no part. We must submit to his grace, accept his will, follow where he leads, all to his honor and glory, not to an expectation that he's going to give us something. There's no candy boxes in heaven. <laughs> he is the reward, the person and work of Christ. This, this is a refrain from an old hymn, and I bet Robin knows it. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be, la oh, to be lost in thee. Oh, that it be no more I, but Christ who lives in me. Goodness does not look at our works. Our acceptance by God is found in the finished work of Christ alone. When Jesus came to John the Baptist, who was baptizing people, not with the same baptism that we have, his baptism wasn't the same thinking as ours is, but Jesus stepped into the water, and who, who spoke? God the Father. And what did he say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God's never said that about me or you. And you're wondering, where is she going with this? <laughs> Romans 11. If salvation is by grace, then it is no more by works. Otherwise, grace is not grace. If it is of works, it's not of grace. Hmm. The redeemed person, because of a gratitude towards God, will commend themselves to God by good works. Our good works are examples of, and here's the analogy, thank you notes. I know it's not really fashionable anymore. I can tell, my, tell you my grandchildren don't ever write me thank you notes. They call me up and tell me, which is nice, but those of us who are a little older were taught to write thank you notes. We are now supposed to be writing thank you notes to God, and I don't mean we're literally writing anything. The point of it is, is that our mindset should be on thanking him continuously. We cannot begin to imagine what he did. We think of the cross, we think of the... Uh, damage done to his body. We think of the torment, the torture, the, the humiliation. Do you realize Jesus was crucified stark staring naked? You know why? The Romans didn't care, but Jews of that day felt that that was the greatest humiliation they could expect, and the Romans did it. We cannot understand what he went through in the first three hours of his crucifixion. Humanity did its worst. But you know what? It was in the second three hours that God did his worst and he darkened the sky so we wouldn't see it. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. And another little side thought for you, which I think is wonderful, is, is we know that at the moment of Jesus' death, that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And we have had, many people have preached on the fact that that opened up the way to God. But let, here's another thought. When a Jewish man is suffering terrible grief because of the death of a child or a spouse or a friend. They tear open their clothes, expose their chests and their heart for all to see because they're in terrible grief. God exposed his heart in the death of our Savior. That's what that veil tearing was about. Imagine. And Caiaphas tore his garments in absolute sarcasm because Jesus wouldn't answer his stupid questions. He became silent. The 
God the Father bore his heart. Remembering your work of faith and the labor of love and patience in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians. Because of Christ, it was what he did, who he was that did it, and why he did it, our good works demonstrate the divine activity within us. So we are to do good things, but not for the purpose of getting God's attention and saying, oh, good little boy, good little girl. No, it's out of, there's two sacrifices that God accepts now, only two, the sacrifice, sacrifice of thanksgiving and the sacrifice of praise. That's in Hebrews. And that's what our good works are to do, to be the sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise to God for what he has done. Our good works are to be the evidence of our living faith. We do what our mouths say and what our hearts believe. Hebrews 10 says, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Paul emphatically rejects any works that people claim they do to earn God's favor. You and I cannot please God. So often we, we take on this attitude of, well, if I keep doing good things for God, he's going to like me better. Eh, eh, sorry. Salvation is granted by grace. And no amount of works can satisfy the requirements of that grace. It's complete in Christ. We cannot extend it or enhance it. Our good works are acceptable to God only as the sacrifices God accepts of praise and thanksgiving. It's for what he has done that he accepts us. For we rely on God's grace, not our good works. Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Being justified by his grace, we should be made inheritors according to the hope of eternal life. Justified just as if I'd never sinned. Wow, think about that. God looks at us as though we have never sinned. And you're saying to yourself, well, that can't be true because I'm a sinner and I, you know, I confess my sins all the time and blah, blah, blah. You know what? Stop it. The only sins we are to confess are the ones we're doing now and then we need to repent, which means we stop doing that. And later we can confess the sins that we've done in the future. But the sins of the past, stop confessing them. Stop listing them. Why do Christians think that they can be archaeologists and go digging in an empty tomb for bones? God says, I will remember your sins no more. I cast them away from me as far as the east is from the west, and I put them in the deepest sea, and then he puts up a no fishing sign. And we go out there and we go, oh, Lord, in case I didn't say I was sorry enough, I'm so sorry. When I was three years old, I know I told my mother I ate my peas, but I really put them in my napkin and threw them away. You know, stop that nonsense. Once they're confessed, they're gone. God says, I don't even remember them. H.G. Spafford, who wrote my favorite hymn, which is, It Is Well With My Soul, said this in the third verse. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the God! that gave me my soul. Now that's a little bit of my paraphrase. But I thank him and praise him for that. 
because in him I'm complete. In him, you and I are whole again. And here's a wonderful thought. Do you know that there is nothing you can do to make God love you more? And there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. He's paid it all, hasn't he? Paul shouts with great emphasis and praise in Romans 7. In me lives no good thing. The good work, works that I would do, I don't do. And the bad things I don't want to do, that's what I do. Wow, how honest he was. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? I want you to stand up, please. And I'm going to yell at you some wonderful words. And when I finish, I want you to be shouting hallelujahs. Do you know that hallelujah we sing, you know, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's nonsense. Do you know it's a, it's a, a, a yelled special thing? It brought down the, the walls of Jericho. Hallelujah. It is a huge shout. Praise God. God. So, Paul continues and he says, I thank God. It is all done through Christ Jesus our Lord, and therefore, what? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Imagine that that's what God thinks of you and me in spite of our frail, feeble, sick, sinful selves. Give me the works not on my eternal life. The only work that pleases God is when he sees his son in us. Thank you, Lord, that our sin, our flaws, our, our spiritual incompetence is not only forgiven, but is also no longer seen by you. For when you see your son in us, you are pleased. Lord, we know it is not our works, but how well we rest in you that brings you pleasure. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Peace in Jesus, now and forever. Yeah, I just have to yeah. take my glasses off so I can see. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope and pray it touched your heart. <laughs>